So my name is Denise. I'm going to be talking about why distributed systems are so hard today. Um, that's my Twitter. That's my website. All of my slides are online on the conference program and also online on my website. So if you, again, if you uh, want to use your phone and take pictures of the slides throughout, feel free to. But don't worry about missing something critical because it's all online already. So by way of introduction, this is actually my first time ever at SRECon. So um, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I currently work as a software engineer at Pivotal Cloud Foundry up in Toronto. Um, met a couple of other people from Toronto here, so that's been awesome. Found some new friends to go to the pub with. Uh, and you may also know me from internet places uh, because I spend a lot of time doodling, um, usually about tech, sometimes not about tech. Here's a sample. I also like to do really weird mashups of things that I like, so like Pokemon and Apple products. Uh, Fire Emblem and the Golang Gopher, and also Fairy Tales and Kanban. So that's that. Uh, I'm also currently working on a book with my friend Steve Smith. Um, so if you have any nephews or nieces or children in your life who might be writing enterprise software soon, <laughs> please consider buying a children's A to Z of continuous delivery for them. So here's a rundown of what I'm going to be covering today. Um, I'm going to start with a brief history lesson a story about how distributed systems got to where they are today, and then a recap, cap theorem. Um, if that doesn't mean anything to you right now, don't worry. It will by the end of this talk. I'll segue a little bit into a deeper look at why network partitions are an especially gnarly problem in distributed computing. And I'll close out by talking about some ways that we can mitigate the pains. So I'm going to go pretty fast through the slides. And again, these slides are online already, if you'd like to follow along a little bit slower. So how did this all happen? So story time. A long time ago, in a data center not too far away, uh, all business applications talked to one database hosted on the company's own hardware usually. Probably that database lived on a server that was in a basement or some windowless server room. Um, Client-server uh, client architecture was fairly straightforward. They kind of looked like this. And of course, we, I don't know, like had dogs and cats on phones. Those were the old days. So. <laughs> This worked for a really long time until IT stopped being this cost center that we had to do. And it started being a business differentiator, an enabler, and a competitive advantage, which meant that we, as a industry, had to start taking IT much more seriously. So what this meant was that data storage, retrieval, data storage and retrieval needs evolved as software became a differentiator rather than a cost center. Today, it's usually not sufficient to have just one Postgres living on premises running all of your business data for most companies. But why did that happen? Um, this is a sampling of reasons. So one of those reasons is that business analysis is a lot more data driven today than it used to be. So you have people who, are, who might have business, anal uh, business analysts in their job title or product manager who want to run um, information rich queries so that they can figure out who their customers are and what they want. Also, we have um, like machine learning and artificial intelligence and all these requirements that require, um, that demand uh, more sophisticated interactions with our data. So that's a new requirement for data retrieval and interaction. Um, and also, we just have more data than we ever did. There's a ridiculous amount of information in the world, and it continues to grow. And we also want to interact with it faster than ever before. So we have things like key value stores, caches, Redis is a probably the most high profile example of one, um, to speed up data retrieval. So to meet the evolving needs of businesses, we started off by scaling vertically. So that means to just add more compute power, whatever that may mean, onto your existing boxes. And that worked for a really long time. It worked until it was too expensive to add that last 1%. Or the current limits of hardware engineering didn't let you add that last 1% that you needed. But fortunately, in the 90s and 2000s, cloud computing came along. So of course, you have your public clouds, AWS, Azure, GCP. Um, but you also have on-premises solutions. Uh, vSphere by VMware is probably the most high-profile example, but there are more. So cloud computing is a, was a game changer because it gave us an easy way to provision new machines in an on-demand fashion, which is good for cost savings, good for uh, running a more diverse set of workloads. So that meant that we were no longer constrained by vertical scaling limits, because now we could horizontally scale. So we can distribute that same workload over multiple machines. So why might you want to leverage cloud computing in this way? Well, 
here's a, another sample of reasons why. So one reason might be scalability. So that means that if you have one machine, but it can't handle the volume of data you're looking to store or the size of a request you're looking to make to it, you need to split that data across multiple machines. You might shard the contents of a database into multiple chunks by some index, kind of like how encyclopedias are broken into volumes in real life. Another reason might be availability. So when you're operating with multiple machines, you also gain the ability to replicate your data. So by having your data served up by more than one machine, you build redundancy into your system. And final reason is latency. So data that can be stored physically closer to where your clients are requesting will mean that the request times will be faster. So there are a lot more reasons, but these are three of the key ones that I wanted to highlight. So I want to talk about modern distributed systems for a little while. Um, you may have heard the term shared nothing architecture. This is the most popular form of network computing, and this is how all the public clouds work. So it means that machines don't share any hardware. Um, they don't share any resources, any visibility into how those resources are being used, which leads to a lot of fun complications that I'll discuss in a bit. But let's zoom out for a second. So what does it actually mean to run a distributed system? So there's been several references already in this conference to the Kletman book, um, but I highly recommend reading this. Uh, Martin Kletman in the book Designing Data Intensive Applications wrote that um, given that we're working with a shared nothing architecture, you have many machines running many processes and only message passing via unreliable networks with variable delays, and the system may suffer from partial failures. <coughs> so distributed computing is really, really hard to reason about. And it's easy to make mistakes, wrong assumptions about how the world works. So in the 90s, some really smart people at Sun Microsystems came up with a list of eight common fallacies that people make when it comes to reasoning about distributed computing. So in quick order, the network is reliable, latency is zero, bandwidth is infinite, the network is secure, topology never changes, there's only one administrator, that transport is free, and that the network is homogenous. So we're going to zo zoom in on this one, the fact that the network is reliable. <laughs> There's more sharks later on. <laughs> so it kind of feels like at this point, we're fencing off a lot of things that are not true, right? But like, maybe some of you are sitting there wondering, well, OK, but like, how do I know what is true? You just told me these things I can't assume. I want to know what I can assume. Uh, also, for all the Linux people in this room, this cat is panicking while eating popcorn. So I'll leave it if you get the Unix joke. I'll give you a high five later, whatever. So this kind of sounds like an epistemology problem. So I actually studied philosophy in undergrad, and this is literally the first time I've used my degree. So that's great. <laughs> um, so epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge, which asks the fundamental question, how can we be sure about the things that we know in the world? So there are two schools of epistemic philosophy, lecture time. First, you have foundationalism, which holds that there are some fundamental truths, kind of like mathematical first principles, and everything else we know is built on those fundamental truths. Or there is coherentism, which means that there is nothing that's truly true, that's like completely true on its own, but when we have enough other things that interlock and logically support the things that we believe, then that's how they reinforce each other, and that's how we build a worldview of what is probably true. So in distributed systems reasoning, whichever one of these schools you personally subscribe to, it's a really hard task to start to identify the foundational truths or the interlocking truths of your world. And of course, what if we're all just brains and bats, and nothing is real, and none of our, our senses are just lying to us? I don't know, the skeptics were kind of the world's first Twitter trolls, so make of that what you will. So uh, on top of that, unreliable message passing is totally a thing, right? Go back to the Kletman quote. The classic case is the Byzantine generals problem. Um, imagine you have two generals, two cats named Bob and Tom, and they're trying to coordinate a war, but they can't reach each other. So they have to rely on a message sender who's kind of an unreliable guy. In the end, the generals can't know whether the message that was relayed was actually from his fellow war maker. I don't know. Um, so this kind of thing actually happens all the time in distributed systems. We have some tools, of course, like we can use mutual TLS with hostname verification to say, this probably came from someone you know, that I expected to come from. But we always have to be thinking about ways of, that people get around that, like spoofing, tampering, messages getting corrupted in mid-flight. 
Of course, we can mitigate a lot of these problems by monitoring our systems and observing our systems properly. Um, this isn't really going to be a talk about monitoring and observability. I think other speakers have covered that, so I'm not going to go too deep into that. So there are a lot of things that we're never going to be able to know, right? But we can know one thing for Mean Girls fans. Shit's going to fail. Which brings us to the next chapter of this talk, the cap theorem. <laughs> so one time my friend told me that it's weird if I talk about thought leadership and technology, like the way that I talk about hip hop mixtapes. And to that I said, Callum, you're wrong. And uh, I'm just going to say that the cap theorem dropped in 2000 <laughs> when Dr. Eric Brewer gave a keynote at the Principles of Computing conference. So what does CAP stand for? C is for consistency, A is for availability, and P is for partition tolerance. So sometimes on the internet, people like to formulate the CAP, where thought leadership happens, people like to th formulate the CAP theorem as, here are three things, you can choose two, just pick any two, doesn't matter. Which means to imply that you can design a distributed system in a way that you can will away one of these things. But that's wrong, <laughs> like, that's not possible. You can't design distributed systems this way. So today there are more frameworks than CAP for reasoning about distributed trade-offs, but if you are really married to the CAP theorem as an analytical tool, you should at least think about it like this. So for reasons that I'll talk about soon, in distributed systems design, you can't will away partition tolerance. That's your constant. Literally, the only way you could 100% prevent partition events from happening is to have a system where you only have one node, at which point it's not a distributed system by definition. So let's go one by one. C is for <laughs> linearizability. <laughs> it's funny because it doesn't begin with C. Um, so the C in CAF actually means a very, very narrow definition of consistency. So it means that if, if you have, so they always use the language registers when talking about this. That basically means if you have a database and you have one row in the database that can only have one state at a given time. So if you have two operations that change your register that flip the cat state from hungry into full that occur in T0 and T1, it means that all nodes in your cluster, no matter what else they have going on in their lives, have to return that the cat is full if any client has seen that the cat is full. This is really, really hard because this basically demands instant and universal replication. Replication can't actually be zero, right? Because you have to have electric pulses that travel along some copper wire for the data replication to happen. So we're upper bound by the speed of fiber optic data transfer. So what can you do? So if you are a database engineer, you probably spend a lot of time trying to get as close as possible to zero, but it's really tough. And of course, there will be other trade-offs as you engineer towards that. And the final thing I'll say on this is eventual consistency doesn't count. Um, this means like things will, ult will eventually turn up in your Twitter timeline, like things will asynchronously get replicated in the background. Uh, that just doesn't count as part of the cap formulation. So there are a lot of different ways to define consistency. Um, Kyle Kingsbury knows much more about this than me. He mapped out all the different definitions of consistency and what they each logically imply. So I highly recommend checking out this blog post. I learned a lot from it, and it also made my head hurt. So um, consistency is not a binary state. It's a spectrum. And we have to be really precise about what state we're talking about. So A. A is for availability. No uh, tricks there. Um, we tend to think of things as being available or not, online or offline, uh, but it's not really a binary state because in reality, things are a lot messier. In reality, we have network latency, um, which begs the question, how can we know if a node is unresponsive or just being slow? Uh, so network latency wasn't part of the original CAP formulation, but it has some really important impacts on detecting and responding to network partitions. So when things are slow, how do we deal with that? How do we know whether to abandon our friend who's chronically late? Well, you can set a timeout. You can set a timeout for your friend. Um, determining what constitutes a reasonable timeout, though, is really difficult, especially the newer your system is, because you have less historical data. So the first time that you set a timeout, you should go pick up some dice and roll it and see whatever number comes up. That's your timeout. 
Um, of course, like over time, you, you learn what is normal. Or you might be lucky enough to pick software that can learn on its own. Like I think Cassandra can learn a little bit on its own. So final letter, uh, P is for partition tolerance. So partition in this case, of course, refers to a network partition, a loss of connectivity between two things that are supposed to be talking to each other. Um, you might also hear it referred to as a net split, uh, network fault, lots of other things. So during a partition event, your nodes might as well be on opposite sides of a wormhole. Um, they can't talk to each other. They have no visibility into what's happening on the other side. You don't know if the other side is operational. You don't know if it's continuing to respond to health checks on their side of the, uh, the split. Um, you don't know if it's continuing to process read and write requests. So the proof of the CAP theorem um, is fairly straightforward. A partition event happens, and you have two parts of your cluster that get divided on opposite sides. So you actually have only two options for how to design for this scenario. Either you let clients continue to read write on their respective sides of the split, which results in the loss of linear risability, because if a request comes in on the red side and is acknowledged, green side will never see that. Or option two, you just stop reading and writing, probably stop writing in one side of the partition until the event is over, but you sacrifice availability in that case. So we'll finish by zooming in a little bit more on why partition tolerance is so difficult to design for. Um, it's because, in short, they're inevitable. How inevitable are they? I'm going to pick on a small San Francisco-based startup for this part. In the, next year, in the first year of a Google cluster's life, it will experience five rack failures, three router failures, and eight network maintenances. And I think that Google is a company that's fairly good at keeping things online. Um, but you can't avoid this kind of thing because your hardware is just going to fail eventually at some point. It's just going to give out. Uh, for example, you could have a router sitting there by itself and it just mysteriously stops working. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, and your network cables are going to give out at some point. Uh, apparently, sometimes sharks mistake undersea cables for a fish and they decide to chew on them. Um, so. Although some journalists at Ars Technica want you to know that as of 2015, sharks are no longer a threat to subsea internet cables because they are literally wrapped in Kevlar now. So that's good. One less reason for partitions. Um, but a second category of problems around why partitions are always going to happen is software is also just going to behave weirdly sometimes. Right? So in multi-tenant setups, you have VMs that can burst and borrow resources from each other. And we don't actually want like, perfect and static isolation because it's not efficient. Um, so when they briefly spike, if someone in your cluster happens to be running on the same box, that might get suspended. And it's going to look like um, a loss of connectivity. Uh, some programming languages might do things like stop the world garbage collection. That also will cause uh, operations to get suspended. Network glitches are randomly going to happen. This is the character glitch from Wreck-It Ralph, which is a great movie. You should all see it. I don't work for Disney. Um, and also, sometimes people glitch, or like people have glitches or do bad things. So I learned, as part of doing the research for this talk, that in April 2009, a person crawled into a manhole and chopped through the fiber optic cable serving San Jose. So some people in Southern California were just like offline for a little bit. So you might be scratching your head now. I certainly was scratching my head at this point, saying like, wow, like, distributed systems are really hard. Uh, there must be coping strategies. There must be ways to make life better. And there are. There are ways that we have to manage uncertainty. We have a whole set of mitigation strategies. Um, and I just want to give a heads up that I'm about to put up two very high density slides. Um, they were originally sketch notes. They were originally not designed as talk slides. So don't worry about reading everything on them. They are included in the deck. So one source of uncertainty is who is writing to my database at any given point in time? So we, may, we might use a pattern like the leader follower pattern. Um, the leader, but the leader is also a node in the cluster that can also become disconnected. So we need a contingency plan to keep things writable in case that node gets isolated. So we use a process called failover. Um, the failover initiation actually usually wouldn't be uh, automatic. I don't think you would really want that to happen automatically. So an operator would come in and like OK it at the end. Um, but this is one way to reduce uncertainty around the specific problem of keeping things writable uh, in distributed systems. And we also have a second category of solutions uh, broadly called consensus algorithms. 
Um, so some consensus algorithms use leader follower internally, kind of like Raft. Also, I learned as part of this research that Raft doesn't stand for anything. It's called Raft because it's a bunch of logs. <laughs> Seriously, I didn't make that up. <laughs> I always thought it stood for something cool, but yeah, okay. Um, Raft is one of many strategies that use two-phase commit to try to keep nodes in agreement about what is readable, what is um, returnable to clients. So I want to close on a more open-ended question. What is even harder than getting machines to agree? And that is <laughs> getting humans to agree. Um, seriously, like <laughs> this is, if you've ever tried to get a group of more than four people to figure out where to go to lunch together, it's so much harder than explaining pack sauce to someone. Um, <laughs> Unlike database timestamps, it's really, really hard to know if humans have a shared state of the world. So maybe like it's not as if we haven't tried to apply distributed system principles into like human systems. A lot of has, a lot of stuff has been written on like what if there was cap for humans, um, and are you know like maybe you have a friend group where you experience a network partition, you can't reach your friend Susan. <laughs> and Susan can't participate in building consensus anymore about where the group should eat. I don't know, maybe this is a thing that some people do. But really, like, the bigger question we're trying to understand is, with all these metaphors, we're trying to figure out how to converge our mental models. And a lot has been said at this conference already about mental models, and for that I'm super happy, because now I know what your mental models are a little bit. So um, this means our understanding of the world. So when a lot of the time, like we don't even have the language to be able to compare and contrast these things. So in this example, you tell three different engineers, we're going to have fish. And they might have very different uh, visual, like they might have very different concepts of what that actually means. Or maybe they have very different ideas of the mental model of the uh, architecture of your system or how things actually work under the hood. So, the systems we build and run today are really, really complex. They're bigger than we can hold in the conscious part of your brains. At least, like, the, they're bigger than I can hold in the conscious part of my brain, which makes having conversations about them incredibly difficult. So the best we can do is try to tease out information about these mental models by looking for information-rich proxies. And also, they're still salivating because software architecture is tasty. I don't know. So incident analysis, um, a lot has been said about incident analysis. This is a particularly ripe arena for mental model comparing and contrasting examination. So if you want to know more about this, I really recommend that you check out what John Allspaw. <laughs> He's not here, right? Uh, even if he is here, whatever. Uh, and his team have been doing this research for the last few years. So how exactly does incident analysis uh, connect to teasing out mental models, though? Well, the real thing that you need is you need to create an environment where you can have a blameless discussion that's optimized for learning. Not for justice, not for blame, just learning. So, for example, what do you think went wrong? Well, oh, like, you know, that's really interesting. I really thought it was this other thing. Um, imagine that, but like, real. So these are recalibration opportunities. And what happens if we get it wrong? So we get things kind of like, I, I didn't draw this, by the way. Um, we get things like what happened at Three Mile Island. And this is a really fantastic talk from Nicholas Means. I don't want to spoil too much of this talk, um, but a bunch of very smart people were put in charge of keeping this nuclear power generator uh, reactor going. Um, so one weird thing happened, and then a whole bunch of cascading things happened. And before you knew it, the generator was completely out of commission. So I really, really recommend watching his talk on this. Um, when we fail to understand the human factors involved in designing systems, it can literally be a matter of life and death, depending on the systems that you work on. So the Challenger disaster is one that, um, at least like when I was growing up uh, in school in America, we learned a lot about this. This is often traced back to the failure of a little device called the O-ring. And O-rings are just pieces of rubber. Like most materials on Earth, when they're heated, they expand. And when they're cooled, they contract. When they contract, air gets through the valve that they're used to seal. And that's bad, by the way. If you're designing a solid rocket, a solid rocket booster, that's bad. It was colder than expected on the morning that the shuttle was meant to launch. 
and the O-rings hadn't had a chance to heat up to the ambient temperature, and the temperature of the O-rings was below the safe threshold that they had been tested at. So why was the Challenger allowed to launch? The Challenger's rocket booster O-rings were designed to operate between 40 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit, although Sally Ride and other people testified later that they maybe hadn't been tested below 50 degrees. But throughout the entire development life cycle, engineers saw that every time the O-ring shrank, the valves would open slightly, but then they would immediately expand again and reseal and just correct themselves. So they were, yeah, so they saw them do this at 35 degrees Fahrenheit, below the range, and they saw the, they saw the O-rings do this again at 30 degrees Fahrenheit. The O-rings were 28 degrees on the day that the Challenger launched. So the O-rings are just one example of many, many ways that anomalies in this particular component in the solid rocket booster joints had become tolerated over many, many years with no intervention from senior level NASA officials. So this principle is broadly, and this term is called the normalization of deviance. Um, from the perspectives of the engineers working on the project, working on the solid rocket boosters, this wasn't gonna be the straw that broke the camel's back. This was going to be fine. I want to give a lot of credit to Foon Turing for writing the original analysis, which prompted me to research this topic a little bit more. So I've linked, so the link to his original blog post is there, and it's also my bibliography. So I was only kind of half joking about epistemology earlier, but in all seriousness, we all have different frames of reference, and humans don't have great vocabulary to figure out what it is that we don't agree on. So I wrote these slides before coming to this conference. I didn't leave it until the last minute, and now like, Initially, I wanted to say, don't accept human error as the root cause, but now I'm questioning, do root causes even exist? Maybe not. But in any case, um, look further. Like, do the hard work to try to figure out what actually happened. Look for the contributing factors. Were users maybe misled by unintuitive design? Did they suffer from alert fatigue? Maybe we fail to understand the assumptions that people would bring into the control room with them. So we have a superpower that's even better than the raft consensus algorithm. We have the ability to empathize with other humans. We have the ability to try to imagine the world through the lens of another human being. Also, I drew this slide before I watched Captain Marvel and now I like, realize there actually is an orange cat in the movie, so it's a little bit weird. Um, but the message I want to leave you with is we owe it to our end users and our teams, to the humans that we work with and work for, to understand and design for the whole system, including the fleshy and inconvenient human parts. Thank you so much. Slides and bibliography. <laughs>